The mycelium reapers were known as the harvesters of souls. They arose from the mycelium itself in order to reap the spirits of the deceased soldiers on the beet red battlefield. They were only visible to those that gained the mycelium vision granted upon the end of a terrestrial life. The reapers offered passage to portals that opened in relation to the desire and heart of the perished soldier. These portals took some of them to the heavenly plantation realms, if their heart was tuned to pure valor and righteousness. Some carotenoids even attained this end. The rarest among them were taken far across dimensions and entered into Lotosian waters. But the carotenoid soldiers that shared the heart of their king, Radix, were sent to another realm. Radix himself, while still conscious, happened to stand where a mycelium tendril touched him amidst the throes of the harvest. Suddenly, Radix was given a vision of a dark galaxy, ruled by a dark flower. The worlds within it slowly came into focus until their dark form was revealed. The planets that he saw were ruled by the apex of technological maturity, which used all of nature and plant life to serve the purpose of whoever reigned. The Reapers tempted Radix with this vision that made him feel like his destiny was far beyond this planet and even beyond the stars of this galaxy. Meanwhile, the last great tree guard soared among those stars, contemplating if he should observe and touch the primordial flower of the Broccolarians with the intention to redeem his species. The Romanesco sages held an intergalactic council at the quantum mycelium capital at the heart of the Latosian galaxy. They were grieved to hear about the fall of Broccolaria, and they brought many mycelium dwellers together to decide what to do. The disembodied priestesses' souls were able to explain what happened through mycelium channels. The council was alarmed to hear that the Carrot Empire had risen so fast as the Rabbit Clan was supposed to have hidden their primordial flower ages ago. They were concerned that the Carotenoids would use the leftover technological knowledge from the Broccolarians to attain intergalactic dominance. This was never supposed to have happened. The Carotenoids had already attempted to conquer the galaxy in ages past, and this time the Council thought their exile to the outer rim of the galaxy was final. But now they knew that exile was not an option. They would have to rally the alliance of the many worlds in order to annihilate the carotenoid genetic line forever. Every species in the plant galaxy was in danger, and so they had to be alerted to prepare themselves, as interstellar battles would be waged over thousands of years of travel. The Council was concerned to find that the last tree guard took off with the Broccolarian flower alone, as he might be tempted by great power. The Mycelium Council put their hopes into the hardy Verdanthians that might be able to stop the Carrot Empire before it was too late. They also hoped that the last two wise ones on the planet might be enough to keep the galaxy in balance as long as the Grand Mycelium Portal was protected. The Broccoli Empire's great heroes during the Potato Battles were the Elder Tree Guards. They had extended their lifespan with Mycelium Biotech and became mighty warriors over the ages. Their leader was Arim. He trained a young tree guard named Vireo to be the best in Broccolarian martial arts. However, despite Vireo's prowess on the battlefield, he fell to a Potaton captain. Arim saw his star pupil losing blood and began a transfusion of his own everlasting life force, which was of a mycelium iron mixture. Arim gave his life to save this young guard. Vireo awoke to find his mentor breathing his last breaths. In a fury, he single-handedly defeated an entire platoon of Potatons. That day, Vireo became known as Iron Stem. Once the Potatons were defeated, the Elder Guards permanently entered the Mycelium Realm, their duty being finished now that their leader was gone. Iron Stem remembered this as he flew across the stars in the Broccoli Mothership. Facing the primordial flower of the Broccolarians, Iron Stem decided he should touch it, as his mentor's last words were to protect the great cauliflower tree at all costs. Now that the tree was burned by the Carrot Empire, he felt that he needed the full power of Broccolaria. He opened the pod, and upon touching the flower, was surrounded by a light and energy beyond anything he could have imagined. Suddenly, he felt the power of a thousand gods surge through him, and with it, a determination to see the carrots fall. The mushroom villagers of the Mycelium jungle were a part of the worlds of sentient plant life since the beginning of time. They were interdimensional travelers of the mycelium mind that also lived in the terrestrial planes. They were known as Mycorians, and while the Ancient Ones explored the quantum mycelium realms of the many worlds and communicated to sentient plant elders in a harmonious fashion, 
There were many young Mycorians that preferred to stay rooted on one planet while receiving such intergalactic information from the ancients. These young Mycorians would then share this crucial information with the Broccolarians and other sentient plant clans. The Mycorians had eyes all over the planet, but they only took a bodily form deep in the mycelium jungle, which kept their physical manifestation hidden from the unworthy. This is where they tended to have friendships with wandering radishans, who sought only to gather and tell stories. One day, a radishan and a mycorian were exchanging stories of the inner realms of Broccolaria, when they felt the presence of Verdea, the last daughter of the Broccolarians' approach. It was this mycorian's duty to guide her into the inner terrestrial realms and show her who she truly was. The Broccoli Empire's priestesses lived in a subtle form within inner Broccolaria, as was revealed to the Broccolarian princess Verdea, who was led by a Mycorian villager to the Mycelium Nexus. From this point, the vast expanse of inner Broccolaria could be entered. Verdea had to root into the Mycelium, which induced a trance state that dissolved her outer consciousness until she was transported to a new world. For most sentient plant beings, this took decades, but Verdea was a natural. The enchanting vistas of inner Broccolaria were revealed to her for the first time. Once she had settled into this inner consciousness, she was brought face to face with a Broccolarian priestess. Voices soon revealed themselves. Do not worry about us, child, for the priestesses of every age live within you, always accessible through the mycelium mind. Only our external bodies were burned. As long as you still live, so shall we. Your quest, however, is paramount. You must reach Iron Stem and show him that we survive. He doesn't understand the inner realms and his misguided dependence on the outer realms may leave our kind forever in shame and ruin. You must reach the Grand Mycelium portal, from which point you can access the entire galaxy. You will be guided on this perilous journey by a Radishan, who will lead you to the last Ginger Root Wizard and a Dragonfruit Dragon, the two most powerful beings on the planet who guard the portal. The ancient mycelium gates became mysterious ruins of the planet of sentient plants. Only a couple were remembered as dormant portals. The aubergines watched over one of them in the west. In the east, the mountain golems of the Potato Kingdom guarded theirs with caution due to their feud with the Broccoli Empire. In the mycelium jungle, one of these portals needed to be entered by the Princess Verdea of the Broccoli Empire. Along with her radish and guide, they took the risk and went through the Myco Gate that transported one to the other side of the sand-swept mountains. The Potatan mountain golems were vigilant and would not let even the smallest of sentient plants slip by unnoticed. Verdea was apprehended at the portal and led by these golems into the cavernous kingdom of the Potato Clan. They were taken deeper and deeper into the subterranean realm with no explanation. Verdea could only pray to the priestesses that she would be protected. Eventually, Verdea and the Radishan were presented before the Potato Kingdom's nobility, who would decide her fate. The subterranean Potato Clan and its nobility had a meeting deep underground, where they surrounded the last princess of the Broccoli Empire. They interrogated her, letting her know that she better have a good reason for being there, considering the bitter age-old feud between their dynasties. It was her Radishan guide who answered them in song. He sung them the tale of the Empire of Carrots from the West, who had seared all before them with flame and travesty. The great cauliflower tree itself having been burned, the carrots had conquered the world. The Potatans were in shock and horror upon hearing this. Some battle-hardened warriors even shed tears. They explained that never in a thousand years could they have imagined this. Despite their differences, the Potato Kingdom lived by a code of honor, and they respected the Broccoli Empire for upholding chivalrous combat during their battles. The Potato Clan never would have burned the tree. They also had respect for the arcane wisdom of the Broccoli Priestesses. Now they wanted nothing more than to see this monstrous carotenoid empire fall, even if it meant reforging a relationship with the last enclave of beetroot warriors at the other side of the sand-swept mountains. It would take a historic alliance between enemies to be able to defeat this menace of the planet. The Potato Clan even decided that they would escort Verdea closer to the Grand Mycelium portal, as they understood their fate was somehow wrapped up with hers. The Artichoke Kingdom was originally a cabbage whale hunting tribe in the First Age. Sitarctus, the greatest whale hunter, set out on a voyage to find his long-lost Cenarian ancestors after his village was raided by the Carrot Empire. 
Guided by the stars, he sailed on a perilous voyage far beyond the Cenarian domain. The seas were harsh and unforgiving. Before he knew it, he awoke on a new shore, shipwrecked, to find himself surrounded by strange new Cenarians around him. They interrogated him and didn't believe that he was a slayer of Leviathans, and they laughed when he said he sought the old whale hunters. They brought him on board their crew anyway, figuring his boldness might make a helpful deckhand. He was now with a band of pirates, and he felt that he would soon prove himself to them. The pirate raids began, and Sitarctus realized why fate brought him to these waters. The ships these pirates assailed were those of the Carrot Empire. Sitarctus felt this was his chance to taste revenge and glory. He quickly rose from being a mere deckhand to being the greatest pirate anyone had ever seen. Sitarctus's fierce combat abilities and strategic mind led them to incredible victories against the Carotenoid naval forces. Their captain's jealousy led to a mutiny which made Sitarctus their new captain. After gaining this role, Sitarctus found them facing their biggest threat. They attacked a ship that was led by one of the Carotenoid guards, Palineo, who would not go down easily. The Artichoke Kingdom's last hope was in the legendary cabbage whale hunter Sitarctus. His status as a captain among Cenarian pirates led him to a duel against one of the last carrot gods, Palineo. Palineo had the mutation of regeneration and was eager to instill awe in the band of pirates, and so regenerated his body in order to grow in size until he was a titan of the seas. He sent a few pirates flying into the water with a flick of his wrist, but found a challenge in Sitarctus. Sitarctus was able to relentlessly attack Palineo from all sides. The band of pirates were in awe not of Palineo, but of their captain that now felt as if he was a hero from a legend of old. It was only mid-fight that Palineo saw that Sitarctus bore a necklace which carried a pearl that could only be won from the belly of a cabbage whale. Palineo grew afraid of Sitarctus upon learning his true power to slay leviathans. Finally, Sitarctus was able to run up to the head of Palineo and drive a spear deep into his brain, halting all of his powers and his very consciousness itself. Sitarctus stood in the wake of this victory, surrounded by his band of pirates who now hailed his prowess. They ended the day with a celebratory indulgence in the ingestion of Cenarian seaweed. Sitarctus chose to take some for the first time, and he quickly attained a vision of a deep secret about cabbage whale hunting that would shake the foundation of everything he thought he knew. Seaweed had a sentience that communicated itself through mind-altering visions. This was experienced by artichoke pirates who would traditionally ingest it after successful raids against the Carrot Empire. Their captain, the cabbage whale hunter, Sitarctus, finally took some seaweed, only after slaying a carotenoid titan of the seas. The visions quickly took hold of him, and he felt the seaweed speaking to him. Voices whispered his name, until they began speaking to him clearly as one. They said, You know us, Sitarctus. Deep in the farthest reaches of faded ancestral memories, a part of you has never forgotten us, nor the secret we defend. Remember, we grow near the flower. You must remember why you hunt the cabbage whales, we guided them to us, so that they would eat the spores of the primordial flower of the artichoke kingdom. That cabbage pearl you wear that came from the belly of a leviathan, it is a spore of the flower itself, encrusted by a coat of cabbage. It will lead you to the tomb of Cantheus, for you are his heir. He was the original whale hunter, and his spear contains six pearls. Reclaim Cenaria. Your pearl will guide you in his tomb to the location of the spear of Cantheus. We believe the cosmic stories of ancient Cenarians point to you, the resurrection of the destiny of Cenaria. Find the spear, and its spores will guide you to the flower. Then, the whales will follow you. The Pinecone tribe was hidden amidst other sentient plants, living deep in the woods upon treetops. Some knew them as the Sylvans. Their center was directly north of the Turnip Clan, which was known for their great painters. The Sylvans watched over them at night, as they were a nocturnal species. Once they found that the Carrot Empire came to conquer the Turnipans, the Carrots were in for a grave surprise. The Sylvans were of two kinds. During the fortnight of the waxing moon, the Benevolent emerged to share provisions for sentient plants that needed them. But at the apex of the full moon, the other half of the Pinecone tribe was waiting to emerge, those of the waning moon. Governed by a different set of energies and principles, they emerged to strike down wrongdoers in the dark of night. 
They wore skulls of previous victims and became the stuff of nightmares for unwitting carrot soldiers. Those of the waning moon seemed to carry with them powers from another world, and they were never defeated in any of their nighttime skirmishes. As such, the carotenoids soon began to fear the fortnight of the waning moon, and eventually the pines themselves. Over time, the turnip clan was left in peace to continue painting unbothered. The Sylvans, however, remained ever watchful. The Yellow Carrot God Prince of incredible strength, Rutan, was an exile of the Carrot Empire. Banished by his own choice, he renounced the ways of the Carrot King and set out in search of a purpose that could guide him in his quest for redemption. He now recognized the culture and value of each clan of sentient plants that he came across. Yet wherever he went, he was perceived as a monster. In his journey westward, he found that Cenarian villagers ignored him completely, not trusting anything he said. Continuing west, he stumbled onto Turnipins that he desired to help in some way, appreciating their artistic talent. Although, he soon saw the skulls of carotenoids fall around him, tossed from treetops. Ominous laughter from mysterious silhouettes sent him away to the north. He thought he might have found some kind of kindred spirit in the Zimei's clan, but they too looked at him as an abomination. He did not know what to do as such an outcast, but he found something that surprised him slightly farther west. In the land of the Radicchio Kingdom, he found a hardy group that exuded a sense of honor that he could not identify. He watched them from a distance, when all of a sudden, a ship of Cenarian pirates arrived, beginning a raid of the carotenoids that ruled over that area. Rutan saw the captain of the pirates and was impressed. He felt as if this leader glowed with a golden hue, charging into the carotenoid ranks with a confidence and valor that had rarely been seen before. The pirates knew him as Sitarctus, but the Radicans seemed to cry out that the heir of Cantheus had finally come to seek the hidden tomb. Sitarctus galvanized the forces to wipe out all the carotenoid soldiers around them, reclaiming the lands of the Radicchio realm. Once victory had been assured, Sitarctus locked eyes with Rutan, and silence fell upon the battlefield. It appeared that Sitarctus felt as if Rutan was a general of this fallen army, and he called him forth, challenging him to a duel. Rutan slowly walked into the center of these fierce antagonists of his kind and pronounced that he meant no harm, but rather sought redemption for his misguided species. The Radicans and Cenarians laughed, some calling him a coward, but gave him a customary sword for the duel. The air was tense before Sitarctus suddenly ran towards Rutan, his sword raised with the aim to behead the yellow carotenoid. Rutan threw his own sword down and lifted his arm up to protect his neck just in time. The blade of Sitarctus broke in half upon making contact with Rutan's flesh. The air became silent and even more tense as everyone murmured to each other. Sitarctus stared at Rutan with disbelief, but discovered a newfound respect for him. He said to all, This is one of the last carrot guards himself before us. You have all heard of the invincible carotenoid. This is him. He could have destroyed me in one blow if he chose, but he didn't. I say he speaks the truth. If he seeks such redemption, let us give him the compass of the exiles. Begrudgingly, but with respect to Sitarctus, the Cenarians obliged. After all, no one had ever returned from the island of exiles alive. Rutan was not afraid of such a prospect, but instead believed that destiny was guiding him to such a destination. Rutan and Sitarctus parted ways, leaving each other with respect, as Sitarctus continued his quest for the tomb of Cantheus, and Rutan now headed for the Island of Exiles. The Carrot Empire had taken over the world, thanks to their god king Radix. While the Broccoli Empire fell, the great library of Broccolaria was preserved. By accessing its tomes, the carotenoids were able to acquire higher knowledge from the mycelium mind, which was presented in holographic form. The mind bubble's information helped the carrots create an order of wisdom keepers as their empire now became the center of knowledge. Radix created a class of scientists that started to use their newly gained technological prowess. They genetically engineered a new breed of carotenoid, a breed of super soldiers and cyborgs that would be the greatest force the planet had seen. As their cities and technology rapidly grew, Radix continued to make other discoveries in the holographic mind tomes of Broccolaria. He discovered the well-kept secret of the primordial flowers, he found that Broccolaria not only kept their own flower hidden, 
but maintained records of the location of all the rest of the flowers of most sentient plant species on the planet. Radix felt as though the Broccolarians had muscled their way to dominance on the planet in this way, and it was his turn to do the same. Although Radix figured he could go beyond what anyone had achieved before, he ordered a series of missions to thoroughly harvest every primordial flower on the planet, intending to collect each one for himself. And so, he pushed for the constant development of technological and military progress, with the ambition to gain enough power that he could ascend to the stars as a supergod, threatening the cosmos itself. Meanwhile, in the kingdom of the Aubergine, ancient rituals were being invoked. They saw that they would have to fight for a future where their culture could be maintained. They had in their midst sorcerers that knew of mycelium nightshade magic, which they hoped would activate their dormant mycelium gate. They practiced a summoning ritual for many moons, until eventually a portal opened. Out of it emerged the silhouette of a purple nightshade they had never seen. A few words greeted them out of the shadows. I am Intellectus. If you would like to help this sentient plant galaxy grow to epic proportions, there are some options to consider in the link in the description. Thanks for watching.